Welcome back. Today we're going to do some mad science, some code golfing. We haven't done this in ages because we've had more productive things to do in general. However, uh, I suppose I should actually start with the good news here, which is that I fixed the bug, at least the most prominent bug. Um, so if we go over to my repository and we look here, we can see I had switched end game and middle game values in the context of this big array nine months ago. So Stockfish is most my version of Stockfish, and only for variants has been observing a defect that I've had no way to trace until now. Um, so you note that. Uh, here's how the official Stockfish upstream repository handles this pawn value middle game, pawn value middle game black piece, pawn value end game white piece, pawn value end game black piece. This is how we read this. And I had switched this so it read white piece middle game, black piece end game, and that's not right. It needs to be white piece middle game. White, uh, black piece middle game, white piece end game, black piece end game, etc. So I had all these values in this array flipped. That's fixed now. Uh, I have no way to test that, but uh, we'll see over time that it does fix something. Um, so, this seriously caught me by surprise. Um, uh, in hindsight, I should not have downvoted this. It offended me the, just how rapidly this had rushed in. Uh, this is very exciting. Somebody had come up with a way to improve performance um, of the move generator, which in my mind made absolutely no sense. Uh, and seriously complicated this particular function which is going to uh, mess with the branch predictor. Um, every CPU these days does some degree of speculative execution and so it'll... I don't know how it's done. It might be done differently from CPU instruction set to, or architecture to architecture. It might be done differently. Compiler to compiler it might be done differently. But the salient point here is, um, if you introduce a ton of new code, God, that's going to be hard to test. So uh, their motivation is actually a decent motivation. Um, and then after putting this pull request out there, they're like, oh, wait, crap. Something seems wrong. If anyone wants to check out what's wrong, help, free for you to help out. And I asked... Hey, you know this big crazy code change you're making? Could you just please try this thing instead? Um, that was misguided. Uh, this particular patch, although far simpler, uh, does not actually improve performance. And then I comment, well, I also tried this. Um, where I say, okay, if you're dealing with types of chess moves that are not normal moves, do some extra special validation at the front end of this. And this afternoon I tried a dozen other things and none of them performed well. Um, so ultimately what I do end up with, um, I don't have a link back to my repo. Let's go back. What I ultimately ended up with was this, which is actually a slight, very slight performance loss um, when I'm dealing with code that has not gone through profile guided optimization. It's the performance loss of adding this one extra condition prior to invoking the other condition that invokes this enormous function. The performance loss here is um, within the margin of error of my measurement. 
And so now we talk about metrics or measurements and stuff like that. So I guess I'll show you my console. Why not? Um, oh, come on. This has to capture, right? There's my browser. Oh, okay. My terminal was minimized. Let's try again to capture this. Properties. There we go. So yeah, this is my terminal. We can see that the performance loss is on executing the entire set of test positions to a depth of 13 ply. Uh, we've searched the correct number of nodes, however many nodes that is, some number of, oh, here it is, 4,287,509 nodes have been searched at a depth of 13 ply to let you know that, yes, uh, when you invoke this on that set of test positions, it searched the same number of positions. So the move generator is the same. Um, I'm being silly. There's no need to test search this. There might be a need to test search this way. I don't know. But also of interest could possibly be just test the performance of the move generator, because that's all I'm changing. Um... Anyway, actually, no, I'm not changing the move generator. I'm changing the thing that invokes the move generator, so I'm doing the right test. Um, so, yeah, like we saw in GitHub, this is the diff. So here we go. Um, we see that if we're we're checking, is this abnormal move type? Is this ampassant or promotion? Is this something other than castling? And if it's not something other than castling, if it is a castling move, is castling legal? So we check that before calling this big expensive function. And this is an extremely lightweight check. Uh, like I said, throughout the course of testing 2 million some, or 4 million positions, this has a cost of, how do I read this? Is that milliseconds? I think that is milliseconds, so that's not good. Um, hmm. Oh, I guess this is summing up all the test runs. Does this make sense? No, I'm sorry, this is the number of nodes per second. So this is a 4,000 node per second difference, which is a 0.4% slowdown. Um, so it is measurable, but it's actually within the margin of error of doing four or ten test runs. But before I try to improve the accuracy of the measurement of the test runs, there is one other thing I want to try. Uh, and thank goodness for uh, preprocessor directives. So I can say, you know, maybe I want to try some different condition here. Maybe I want to check instead of um, whether castling is legal, maybe I want to see is this move an en passant move? And if it is an en passant move, then what's something that would be true for en passants? Um, I guess. Uh, we haven't verified that there is a piece on the piece uh, on the from square. Um, two is equal to EP square. Is that how you write that? Uh, or EP square. Okay, yeah. Fine. Um, and I could complicate this comparison if I so desired. Um, but if your destination square is not the opposite square, then there's you don't have privilege to be able to move to that square. Um, yeah, let's try that. So we've got a build script here. Oh gosh. I thought that would look nicer in this terminal. Okay, there's way too much noise in this build script. Um, 
let me clean up a couple lines here. And now, yeah, we see I've commented out about half the lines of the script, so we don't make clean every time we build. But we are going to compile after checking out whatever... I should probably change the branch name on the script, even though I'm not doing any of the, the, the stuff where I have to alternate between branches. Um, but yeah, here I've already created a git branch name, so we've checked out the correct branch name. We do compilation, we check that um, we're getting the correct number of legal moves. There's no need to test that. We're not testing the move generator. What am I doing? The move generator is not the thing being tested, it's the thing that invokes the move generator. So we want to do this test here. And then if this is successful, then go on and call bench parallel. Um, so, yeah, compile with my modified instruction here. Oh, so then I call sudo here, and the reason I call sudo is to suspend the background process where I'm uploading some of my computation power to over here. Uh, I'm contributing to the multivariant Stockfish website. Um, I'm one of the active contributors here. Although, since I'm doing these performance tests of my own code, um, I have to suspend I have to decrease the noise on my machine, so I temporarily take my machine out of the queue and stick it back in. But this is where all these variants get tested, and this is where we found... Um, where was it? Where did I find it? Actions. So in this test that I had ultimately deleted, I was looking at these evaluate or this is some performance tuning stuff, and I was seeing some really weird shapes of curves here, where this is just looking more or less random. There's uh, really no direction or purpose to any of these curves, um, which triggered me to look at, okay, what's my input? And I was looking, okay, for atomic chess, uh, parameter 1 and parameter uh, 1 for endgame here. Both have a starting value of 240 for whatever that unit is. So the endgame value of a piece in Atomic and the middle game value of a piece in Atomic were the same. And that clued me in that uh, I was doing something wrong. In fact, if you look here, 244, 244 down here, 437. 552, etc. So, like, all of my parameters were backwards um, for nine months. Nobody told me. Nobody would have known, but nobody told me. Um, so I had to figure that out today. And immediately thereafter, we did a test to correct this. Uh, so, I didn't test every single variant, but here's the patch that we showed you earlier that, uh, that's not it. Just kidding. Not that one. Um, where's my patch? Here it is. D-bias variant material evaluation. And that was the best description I could come up with for I fucked up all these parameters and I'm unfucking it. So, there we go. It all works. Um, and the reason we know this works is because we did a test. And my test, uh, the patch won against the unpatched version uh, like 51% of the time, which indicates that there's no regression. So we can get more into the details of how that test is done, but look at all the green lights, and based on that we know that this test was successful, so this patch is good. Um, so, yeah, we fixed that, um, okay, I've been stalling for time while this background test runs, but it's completed, um, so, I forget what we said last time, we had like a point, 
3% slowdown. Here, now with this latest patch, we have a 0.17% slowdown, so 0.2. Um, so, uh, this, the parameters to this test, um, I guess, are worth examining a bit. So we're saying allocate 256 megabytes of memory, search to a depth of 13 ply. Um, if I want more data, uh, I could change the number of ply here to be used in a test run from 13 to 15. Just And we just rerun the build script, read the build, checks if I've updated any of the source files, reruns this sanity check that the correct number of nodes are searched, and um, now it's going to go through 10 more runs, and we'll see whether or not that improves anything. Uh, oh, that's going... even for 15 ply, that's pretty quick. Um, so yeah, instead of checking for castling and this special castling privilege, now we're going to check if it's en passant, is the destination the en passant square? which means you have to have an opposite square and the destination has to match opposite square um, before we call this big expensive move generation function. Um, so if this fails, then the next thing to try is a combination of this castling comparison plus the opposite comparison. Uh, so if we're if the move type is castling check, is uh, castling legal if the move types en passant check is en passant legal and then I don't know there's other stuff you could check too like if it's promotion check that there's a promotion piece involved in the move I guess like so um, let's see have I vamped long enough how far has the test gotten 8 out of 10 Let's see, is the 8 capture here? No, you can't actually see the final line in the terminal. Sorry about that. I'm doing what I can to try to crop this, but this is not as easy to crop as a browser is. All right. Oh, I should keep more abreast of what's going on with the Lee Chess API. I'm excited that they're doing... Somebody asked for some client like capability with the API. Something like, I want to be able to check who are the friends in my friends list, etc., who are logged in. They want to make their own LeechS app um, that's kind of user-friendly. All right, so our slowdown here is a negative slowdown. This is a speed up. Um, so we get a speed up ranging between uh, 12,000 nodes per second faster and negative 2,351 nodes faster. So there's a spread here. Um, this is interesting. I didn't think this would work. I thought we were going to go through every other permutation than the ones I've already tested and find that none of them work. I did not expect to outsmart all of the leech, uh, all of the stockfish developers on this one um but i think i just got lucky either way uh on uh, passant rights sure uh get status get commit um So we're going to navigate back down here. Oh, right. So I I was thinking maybe I wanted to try combining both of these conditions. But that seems a bit overkill in light of the fact that I actually had a successful test. Let's tempt fate. I've already committed my change, so I can revert this pretty easily if it doesn't work. Uh, okay. 
So is the move type castling? If not, check that it has to be a legal castling move. Is the move type Ampasan? If not, check that like this. Um I guess the only qualm I have with this now is if I look at types.h. And the definition here, normal promotion opposite canceling. So because I'm being a little bit OCPD at the moment, uh, yeah, I want to rearrange these statements here. Like so. There we go. Uh, close enough, whatever, um, all right, not close at all, <laughs> okay, let's try to fix that, um, okay, this aligns with this, the ands align here, now, if I'm trying to fit this to 80 columns, this is column 44. Uh, does this actually fit on one line? I think it does. Yeah, 62. That fits in one line. This fits within column 80. I probably should stick the space back in here. There we go. So check if the move type's not en passant, the destination has to be the en passant square. If the move type is uh, castling, castling has to be legal. Um, all right, I'm going to run this for another 10 iterations. How's your day going? <laughs> All right, still can't get my Leech STV board showing. I'm so confused by that. Maybe OBS has a defect. Um, let's hide the terminal and find something entertaining to do for a few minutes. Uh, we could do some puzzles. So I know it shows in uh, GitHub that I have a couple pings. Um, I don't actually have another browser installed right at the moment. I don't feel like installing one on stream, but we'll eventually get to this. This is my backlog. This, I want to upgrade my chatty bot to the latest phantom bot. But that's not going to be trivial, so I'm putting it off over and over. Um, oh, yeah, we could wait. F uh, what's the saying I'm w thinking about? A watched pot never boils. You could take a look at this, see. Um, this parameter in particular is the one I want to know the correct value of. So you see this is waving up and down and up and down. Um, whereas previously it would just gently wave up and down a bit. Very. Uh, this indicates some entropy. Like this indicates um, that the uh, tests are actually having different results, which are causing this to severely wave up and down. You could uh, you could use a Gaussian smoother. Oh yeah, so you could like this omits some of the data points to make a smoother curve if you feel like this is too distracting. But the fact that this is such I don't know is such noise indicates that like something's actually going on here. Uh, previously, all these curves were um, not very acute. Um, but so even this is kind of encouraging that you have a curve that's going in one direction. Uh, how about this one? Yes, yeah, so the ones that I guess are most interesting are these where it starts from one value and just slides toward another value. Although these values are really close together. You couldn't tell it by looking at the axis, but... Wait, middle game threat by blast. So this is the value of... Um, this is the bonus that's assigned each time an atomic capture occurs, removing a block of pieces. And so 
if this bonus is too high, um, then positions with lots of threats to remove pieces are um, prioritized. So you don't want the bonus to be artificially high or artificially low. Um, but I think this bonus relies on having accurate values of all the pieces for all the game phases. So this is the value of piece number two, which is the knight in the end game. Piece number one, the pawn, is declining. Uh, where do we have something else entertaining? Now, I messed up like submitting some of these because I should have tuned... Um, well, we'll get to that eventually, or we won't. But either way, this test is not one of those that's actively running on these 84 cores and 9 machines. Um, let me see. Buddy, buddy, there we go. How's our test? All right, so last time we measured a speed up of, what was it? Three tenths of a percent. With this latest change, we get one tenth of a percent speed up. Uh, previously, our standard deviation on the speed up was 8,000 versus here, our standard deviation is 3,000. So we've made a much noisier function, or a, a function with a much different distribution. Interestingly, um, yeah, this 8137 actually represents the difference in this standard deviation versus this standard deviation over some root mean square whatever mumbo jumbo math you're supposed to do to compare bell curve distributions or gaussian distributions so the fact that this actually has somewhat of a stable um well i don't know how to put it but anyway um let me try changing back that parameter we changed earlier from 15 to 13 pi and see if I can still reproduce the results. This test should run much faster. And if this runs quickly, well, I think what we'll find is that this is still a small speed up, but um, our standard deviation is going to be enormous. Um, or at least the difference. Uh, why do I believe this? Um, so my proposed patch now is going to be check check this condition also check if you're trying to execute an ampassant move make sure ampassant's legal before you call the move generator so my expectation is that this function here is both costly and has a high standard deviation in terms of cost and so running some small checks up front to ch uh, see if the move is legal or not um based on, like, are you trying to do en passant in a position where you can't do en passant? Are you trying to do castle um, when you don't have a castling right? Some extremely primitive things um, should greatly reduce the standard deviation and execution time. But each condition we add here could in some way manipulate the branch predictor, which could be a bad thing. So adding code that improves performance doesn't always do so when you take into account the branch predictor and its magic. Yeah, so as we decrease the number of nodes per test, um, originally with that extremely noisy function getting all the time, this getting called all the time, this was performing well. This is performing... Um, this is performing less well than this, although the standard deviation is less. Um, so let's simplify my code patch. So again, thank goodness for preprocessor directives, so you don't have to write and unwrite and rewrite code all the time. This just comments out these two lines of code there. And we call the script again, and it compiles everything and runs all the tests. This should be quick. We'll just watch it. They say a watch pot never boils. It's because nobody's patient. Uh, Data watched a pot and it did boil. 
and it took the exact number of seconds every single time to boil. There's this clip. Um, I'm sorry, there's this segment of the show that somehow survived onto YouTube where Data's watching a tea kettle. Um, he heats it up and it starts boiling in like 42 seconds or something every single time. Um, and he's inquiring of his crewmate, like, why is this? They say that it doesn't boil, but clearly it boils in the same amount of time every single attempt. And the crewmate tells him, you know, not everybody has an internal clock and perceives things the way you do. So. I want to say that it had a point. It didn't. It was just an amusing anecdote. But it worked, didn't it? All right, so simplifying my code patch now, um, we have a speed up of half a percent on a shorter test run. Not only is this faster, but the standard deviation in execution time over 10 runs is smaller than the original. So, um, this I guess means that there's less for the branch predictor to work with but it's performing better, so that's fine. Um, all right. So the next step. This is silly, isn't it? So yeah, this is the same functional equivalent as with the commented out code. This is the version I want to submit to the official Stockfish team for consideration because I just improved their function. Um, improving the overall performance of the entire engine by half a percent. We're going to save the ice caps, guys. Or at least get some better chess analysis. Uh, so, same difference, right? Um, Alright. Push. Uh, let's push opposite rights. And um, all right, there we go. There's my code patch commit ID. Um, let's see. Uh, But nobody's going to believe that over 10 runs. Um, so I took this bench parallel script from somebody else's work. Um, oh, hang on. We should try running this with other parameters, too. Um... So this is what this looks like. Uh, do, 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 do. So Linux devs should understand what that means. Um, or at least Linux uh, developers who use a Unix-like or Bash shell should have some understanding of what that little command I just typed out meant. Um. Yes, yeah, so we're going to do one other thing. Instead of allocating 256 megabytes of memory, do we get the same result with 16 megabytes of memory? Um, now, I get that this is within the margin of error. It's unlikely that this code addition is going to be accepted by the official Stockfish development team because this is added complexity. Um, they are strongly averse to it. However, um, this, oh, I'm sorry, you can't even see the browser anyway. As I alternate between windows, I have to remember to show you which window I'm on. So yeah, I typed out time stockfish and then all the parameters here. And here are my test results. 
uh, which indicate a half a percent improvement but over 10 test runs. 10 is not an adequate sample size for this kind of work. For this sort of thing, you ideally would like 30 to 40 runs. And so let's consider doing that. But first, check out if we do this with smaller memory. Oh, interesting. OK, so if we have less memory allocated, um, yeah, this is an even clearer result although it's less prominent. Um, let me stick it up in the browser. So do, do, do. And we do, we're doing this with 16 megabytes of memory at 13 plies. Yep, so over 10 runs. You can see the first run got 7,000 more nodes. The fifth run gets 7,000. A lot of these had some number of thousands of nodes better. Uh, for a 3% or 0.3% speed up. Um, uh, Zero point three cent speed up. So yeah. Um again we're adding code. This is making code more complicated. There's a chance that this won't get anywhere. Um but I just felt a need because I maintain a downstream repository that accepts everything from this repo. If they're going to make some crazy code change because this guy or some other developer would like them to, I'd like to anticipate what they're doing before they switch a half of the code in the engine and it becomes hell to merge. So if I can find some kind of simple solution, um, that's for the best. But also, I'm just curious. Like, code golfing can be fun. Um, so I was going to say we need to do more tests. And actually, we do. This is... So this is the margin of error. 2,000 node per second increase. Um, this is the measurement. So 2,883 node per second increase with a margin of error, 2,086. This is actually still within two sigma of this. This is sigma. So two sigma exceeds this. So you want to do more runs. And that's not a problem. We can do more runs. It's just going to take a second. So let's go back. Um, so here where I'm saying, oh, yeah, here we're saying do this test for 10 iterations. Let's do 40 iterations. This is going to take longer. Um, but yeah. That's interesting. That decreasing the amount of memory that's consumed by the engine also decreases the standard deviation of performance. I guess there must be something about how much memory you're allocating that affects how often you're using the transposition table, and how often the entries in that table are valid. It's really complex, but uh, let's see. Oh yeah, this is testing again. Is my bot doing okay now that I've deployed it with my latest, greatest engine? It's commenced in a stare down with another bot that's kind of abandoned the board. Uh, that's cool. Just keep staring it down. You'll win eventually. No, you won't, but it's still amusing to think you might. Uh, played one a time. Oh, right. <laughs> uh -huh. So this engine is using the neural network values for all variants. And, like, everything needs to be tuned before it makes sense for it to use those values. So, oops, that's not right. I did play in a tournament. This is the game I was looking for. 
where I played an opening book uh, trap, I guess, against it. Um, so this, is, I guess, is not the best move. I'm not an expert in atomic chess. But we ended up playing the Queen B6 um, atomic opening. And this results in an end game that's actually favorable to white. And it's very difficult for black to hold this. And to Stockfish's credit, it put up a very good fight, but um, could not overcome all the difficulties that I had set for it. So exchanging my bishop for the knight here, I thought would simplify things, and in retrospect, this engine agrees. Um, but yeah, I think if all the parameters were tuned, perhaps the engine would not have gone into this line in the first place. The other thing I have to watch out for is if this pawn had made it to the light square and stuck mine on the dark square, then it could threaten to sack here and then promote the B pawn. Um, so there's two strategies against that. One would be, instead of pushing my pawn up like I did, um, the really simple solution would... Oh, I'm sorry, tucking my king on B1 is not going to help, because then this sacrifice comes anyway. Um, See, so yeah, if I let this pawn advance, and then I let this... If I let this sacrifice occur, you know what I mean. Um... Then the pawn will be here. My king cannot be adjacent to this pawn, so my king's got to be like somewhere over here. Okay, I guess the sacrifice is still not a threat. Bishop takes pawn, and then my king could race over and stop this from promoting. Barely. And therefore, yeah, I should have a free hand to attack on um, the king's side. So, yeah, if things had gone this way... Um, something like this. Uh, I can't take the bishop, but I just promote all my, or push all my pawns. One of these eventually promotes, or the bishop has to be sacked for it. And then this king has to give way to my pawn due to Zugsfong. So, yeah, this position's completely winning. Um, it's after I've taken this knight that Stockfish can't save this game. Um, so I've spent some effort trying to improve those end games, but for now we'll take it. Um, yeah, hopefully I'll get the neural networks and all that tuned, but this is an extremely nice victory to have. So how's this test going? Oh, it's done. All right. So with 40 runs, we measure that this is a 0.02% slowdown. So we've done more testing. Um, and these are the results. And we have to accept that those are the results. So if you're doing lots of testing at 13 ply, um, this is not a speed up. So we need to report that. Which, uh, fine. Forty iterations. Um, But I think this is the best we can get. So, um... I have not tested every other possible combination of parameters here. Um,
want this to be consistent with how we formatted the rest. So this is a positive 0.3% speed up uh, for 10 iterations. Uh, plus or minus 0.3%. And down here, this is a 0% speed up uh, plus or minus 0%. Like this, yeah. It's negligible at that point. Um, so, I again uh, don't think that the official Stockfish developers are going to accept this, but. Um, this is pretty clever, regardless. Um, so there's no need to generate the entire move list every time an opposite move it needs to be validated in this way. Um, in almost all cases, the opposite square is not going to be the same as this destination square. Um, and the reason I say that is if you have transpositions, like, say you've got, uh, wait, are you able to see? Yeah, you can see my browser. Let's go to Lee Chess. If I show you a transposition, you'll have some idea what I'm talking about. So, um, <laughs> yeah, let's say we've got um, this Scandinavian opening. And we take here, and black place C5, and we take en passant. Or at least we have this ability to do this. Now let's say we get here through a different move order. Um, so we get here through Scandinavian this way. They played C5, we protect the pawn. This would be a, considered a transposition. Except the positions are not identical. Um... So, yeah, if you get into this kind of quandary and you're accessing moves from the transposition table and it suggests this pawn capture and you're like, wait, that's not legal here because Black's previous move was not C5. So there's not an opposite square here. Um, whereas over here, uh, this is actually legal because Black did play uh, C5 just a second ago. So, that's the idea. Um, almost all the time, or much of the time, that many moves are going to be pulled out of this table. <sighs> Other circumstances could be, like, these pawns are not even here. This pawn didn't even make it to C5 whatever like this move could have come out of the transposition table as hey just in general this is a very good move um so anyway that was kind of clever the only other thing that could maybe improve this would be some kind of comparison that's wait um where is it in here that we check that our... Oh, I'm sorry, here's where it is that we check that the move type is normal. But say you have a normal move type, like you got to move out of the transposition table that you know that pawn takes on c6 is good. And the reason you know pawn takes c6 is good is because you tried this and you found pawn takes c6. This is not an opposite move. And then over here you're like, oh... Well, pawn takes c6, and you, you try to play this without recognizing the opposant aspect of it. Where does that get validated? So, this function is pseudo-legal. Uh, so this access some things out of the board class, or position class. Um, but if your type of move is normal, 
We do check, do you not have a promotion piece set? But I don't think we check anywhere. Are you moving to an Ampassant square unwittingly? Does it matter if you're unwittingly moving to an Ampassant square? Even if you're not intending to play Ampassant? Uh, hmm. How does this work? So here's the other half of, after you've done pseudo-legal move validation, we verify as the move you're playing not about to put you in check. I don't see anything here that checks, like, if the move type is normal, but we happen to be going to Ampassant Square, that's bogus. Um, yeah, no, there's just a bug in Stockfish. I don't see any alternative explanation for this. So, wait, oh, no, I'm sorry, it is handled in here, indirectly. Okay, um, so pawn takes c6. If not pawn attacks an opposing pawn or piece. Okay, so, yeah. This is verifying that the move is not a capture. Um, so I guess in this case where you've got Pontic C6 out of the table of cool moves, you would determine that, okay, this is something I want to check if it's pseudo-legal or not. And because it's moving to the Ampassant square, we're not cap catching the fact that um, that's actually a capture which could be played. That's amusing. Um, yeah, having this whole flag be part of that object is confusing. Um, regardless, it is validated somehow. Uh, so yeah, if we were doing a normal move type, then it has to either be a single push, or a double push, or a capture. Um, and if it's none of those, we return false here. So uh, the fact that pawn takes c6 could be legal here by virtue of a different rule doesn't really matter. Um, that's a super uncommon use case, I guess. Without measuring, we wouldn't know. But, like, why would you have this special move type? Is it really beneficial to have a special move type just for the special pawn capture? I mean, I get that, like, yes, if you're moving to the Ampassant Square, you need to check this. Um, but couldn't you just move this condition up here and not have the special move type? Or is the undo move function broken without this being defined? Opposite captures a tricky special case because they're rather uncommon. Yeah, okay. What the purpose of this whole block is, is to make sure you're not putting yourself in check by way of removing two pawns from a rank uh, or some other kind of magic that could somehow accidentally put your king in check. Um, but you don't need a move type devoted to this whole concept. It was convenient to write the code this way, but the type of move is just a normal move that happens to be going to Nampassant Square. That's so weird. All right, we're going to try Mad Science Experiment number two. Um, wait. So, yeah, we've got this whole concept that you don't need. That doesn't need to be defined. So we can just do without that. Um, and see, um, we could probably disable the parallel bench testing for now. 
Uh, eventually, we're going to cut that down to a really small, finite test. But for now, I touched a header file, which is going to cause everything to recompile. Um, Position.h breaks. All right, why is opposite required to be defined here? If this is a capture, um, <laughs> right. Okay, so we're checking that. King takes rook is not considered a capture. Uh, over here to know if a move is a capture, uh, we need to know the type of the piece being moved. Um, where do I get the piece being moved from? Um, Wait, wait, wait. There's a function for this. Move piece m equals pawn. Um, now, not every pawn move is a capture. Um, so another way we could define this would be and uh, two square move is equal to ep. Uh, EP square this is how we access this. All right, so if we have a pawn that is destined to the enfaissant square, that is also considered a capture. All right, so we don't need a special move type for that purpose. Um, where else might we need a special move type? Now granted, I'm calling this crazy, or mad science, because um, it's not going to perform well when we're done. If it did, somebody would have tried this already and been successful. Alright, so... Fine, we can have a different make function somewhere that generates a move. Um, hmm. Three, five, seven. Okay, this is interesting. So I need a way to determine whether a move is considered to be an opposant move for this to be executed. Okay, we'll make a helper function for that. Um. There we go. Easy. So now we have a function to determine whether or not a move is considered... Oops. Or is the wrong logical operator for this. It needs to be Boolean and. Okay, we have a function. Um... So over here, uh, do, 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 do. instead of that, you could say check whether or not it's an opposite move this way. Now, like I said, every time I add a condition here, that's one more thing that could slow it down. It's not likely that this is going to perform better when we're done. 
Um, all right. And since I don't feel like leaning heavily on the compiler at the moment, let's use grep to find the remaining things. Oh, type of move is equal to... Okay, yes. Um, like I was saying... Don't need a move type to determine whether or not that's opposite. And this assertion is no longer required because that's part of the definition of opposite. Um, where else do we check this? Nope. I'm just trying to autocomplete search.cpp. All right. Assert. The move type is not this. Um, you leave out the P in passant, it becomes ascent, which is not right. Um, oh wow, we've got this whole move case thing going on. We could come back to that in a bit. Um, It's just so much easier to like have this helper function, which we can just call all over the place and not have to do this type of this type of that everywhere. Um, put this in my copy buffer. Put it in the copy buffer again. It's called M there, yeah. All right, so this is the only remaining place where we need this. <sighs> Type of M. Okay. So we're going to add a condition here. In fact, this is the condition we're going to add. Uh, so if uh, Passant do a whole bunch of stuff, else return false. Um, and the stuff we're going to do is these five lines. And we have these four lines of comment to go with it. And we don't need to have a special case for this. There we go. Um, if this actually performs well, we can consider formatting the code better. Um, We've already handled the case of so direct, etc. So the only case we need the unusual discover check. Yeah. Oh, so we don't need this else keyword because this has a return statement. Hooray. Yeah. This is not so difficult to format. This is still a very unusual condition. It's the reason I kept saying this is not going to perform is because um, we are executing a couple conditions every sing single time we call that helper function. We're calling uh, get the moved piece, which is kind of heavy, uh, extracting a value from that, and then getting another value out of this move object and comparing it with another value. Um, so the compiler might improve some of this stuff for us, but we'll see. Um, yeah. There we go. That's as good as that's going to get. So there's only one remaining reference to this constant, and I think that's in types.h. Where make here is declared. Um, 
So a from square, a to square, and a piece type if you're doing a promotion or a default of a knight if you're not. Um, so we don't need to make an opposite move there. We don't need this special metadata anymore. That's just a normal move. Is this how we make normal moves? <laughs> how do we make moves? We have make castling, make promotion. Normals. <laughs> oh, make move. All right. Is make move defined in type step H? I could use grep to find this out. Um, yeah, it's declared make move right there. So, um, there we go. Let's build it, see if it compiles. If it compiles, see if it passes. <laughs> Not on the first try. All right. Um, Okay, 374. Use of undeclared identifier. Oh, you're correct. I have to declare a function to be able to use it. So, um, it would also help if I passed the parameter in, wouldn't it? Uh, Alright, so... Hmm, we got capture, capture, or promotion. Let's put en passant after that. So, strain. Oh, okay, whatever. These are in a different order in terms of how they're de defined down here than how they're declared up above. Whatever. Um,. Uh, does this compile? Wow. Am I actually getting this to compile on my second attempt? Like, okay, yes, we had that one failed compilation earlier when I first removed the constant, but, um... That was an intentional failure. So we had one accidental failed attempt. Okay, here we go. No signature obtained from bench. Code crashed or assert triggered. Sweet. That's exciting. That's what we always want to hear. That code crashed. All right, let's try this uh, with the debugger. Sig abort. Sig abort happened over color of no piece. Undo move. It positions CPP line 914. Uh, 914. Uh, do, do, do. What's this about? Oh! Am I forgetting something about the semantics of how undo move is used? Uh, I think so. So I think undo move is reserved for non, or is reserved for only normal move types. And if you have a non-normal move type, there's no way to undo it. Um, hmm. Hmm. <laughs> ST captured piece is not okay. Well, 
The condition that failed is that we had a captured piece with piece type none. Okay. Oh. Uh, yeah, we can't rely on this definition anymore. The type of move is not normal. Um, <laughs> this got more complicated all of a sudden. And this is the hidden complexity all along. So, yep, we're going to check for every single normal move. Is the normal move an en passant move? That certainly will tank performance. Um, so Stockfish devs had it right all along. Um, that was a fun bot experiment. But um, yeah, this is not going to work. Or this will function, it just won't perform better. Omission of this move type is just not worth it. The fact that some captures will accidentally get counted as en passant moves, uh, whereas previously they weren't. When there is an actually an en passant square available, um, I don't know. I don't think it's going to be worth it. Oh, hang on. We've got another error. Where's this? Undo move. Or I could dump out the position if I needed to. Um, but this is in the middle of some other search operation. Piece not equal to no piece failed at undo move line 914. So, yeah. There's only so much you can do. Are there other parts of the code where normal is explicitly checked for? Um, so if a move type is not normal, we're going to return, is the move not a castling move? Otherwise, check if it's, yes, yeah, so that's fine. Over here, oh, hang on, I want to check specifically for this constant normal. So position SVP and oh search at CVP uh, down here. Decrease reduction for moves that escape a capture. Uh, filter out castling moves because they are coded as King Captures Rook. And hence they would break the make a move function. Um they didn't mention here that you want to also filter out en passant moves. Okay, but maybe that's not the headache. Possibly. Unlikely, but um uh but fine, let's add a condition here. Just to be safe. Uh, so if the type of move is not normal, we have to have some special move validation witchcraft go on here. Um, hmm. You have to think about that more. Okay, we already dealt with this. Wait, okay, just one, two, and hit bottom, continuing at top. Okay. There's only these two uses of this constant. Uh, um. And the question of the minute is, do we need this? 
Well, first verify whether or not this compiles and runs without error. Then second code golf it further. Aborted. This still fails. All right. Um, where did this fail this time? Position CPP 914 again. Uh, I mean, we've looked for... Unfortunately, type of is overloaded and terribly named. So it can refer to type of move, type of um, piece. I think some other things are typed as well, and they are also possible parameters to type of. So... Hmm. I guess we could take a look at what called undo move is 1289 out here. So this is in the context of... Wait, so this is step 15, there ends 15, 16, etc. So, huh. This is just search. This is the main search function, which is enormous. But okay, after we're done searching, we have to undo the move. And undoing the move is failing because nothing has been captured. Um, so. Hmm. Is there some problem with how I defined capture out here? So if it's opposite, it's a capture move. If it's opposite, oh, let's see, if not empty and type of is not castling. Okay. So yeah, maybe this definition's not right. That seems unlikely. No. Oh, I'm sorry, if you're creating the reverse of a move, the reverse of a move has its from and two squares reversed. Hmm. So, yeah. Potentially this could still be messed up. I'd need to add more logging to figure out what's going on, but yeah, like here we're going down the rabbit hole. We removed a constant. This removed a bunch of other code that relied on the constant being present, but still we've not produced something functionally equivalent to what was originally there. Um, so the choice of digging deeper, adding more logging, or just calling it quits. Um, I expected that the initial refactor removing the constant, replacing it with functionally equivalent code would be straightforward, and it's just not. Um, wait, here we are. ST captured piece. Um, you can see how this captured piece is getting assigned to the value of captured. And the value of capture is defined somewhere in this make move. Uh, yeah, so if you have an opposite move, the captured piece is a pawn, so this is correct. Um, hmm. That's so weird. Key after computes the new hash key after the given move. Used for speculative prefetch, does not recognize special moves like castling Ampassant promotion. Well, Ampassant's no longer considered a special move, so maybe that's the issue. Huh. I mean, this could be the issue. Check for legality just before making the move. 
And then, yes, yeah, somewhere here. Is there not a legality check here? That's weird. <sighs> Why is there not a legality check here? What are we prefetching? We're prefetching the position. Um, so this function here could be borked, I guess. Um, Type of move is not or equal to castling do all the following. Huh. A non-king move is legal, if and only if it's not pinned or okay, but yeah, we've already returned up here. Um That is so weird. Well, adding a little bit of logging is not a large endeavor. It's not going to end well. Um, so this is where we fail. So if this condition is violated, this is actually equal to we are capturing the king. Print out position to standard error. Which is going to be some string, uh, some C style, style string. And we can put that into Lee Chess and take a look at the whatever this looks like. Wait, where did my printed out thing go? Types.h 410. Do we not fail at the same place? Line 913, um, 913, oh, okay, just kidding, so, um, if this condition is false, then we're going to do the printf. I mean, this code should be deterministic. I must have read the line number incorrectly. Um, Alright. This code should... 915. I was saying this code should be deterministic. Um, it's not deterministic. That's cool. Whatever. Um... All right, so now if either of those two conditions are failed to be satisfied, the FEN string should have printed out, and it didn't at 904. 904 here. Okay. I feel like something's yanking my chain here. Um, but fine. So if not is okay move. Um while we're at it, can we also print out the move in question? Yeah. Let's get that printed out. It still did not dump any output. 905 is where we failed. M optimized out. Search 1289, whatever. Um, adding the logging code should not 
produce errors. Somehow this got executed before this line of code got executed. Either that or this print statement just didn't print, which doesn't make sense. Uh, all right, let's run this without the debugger. Just go. It still printed nothing. This condition was satisfied until the next line of code down where it was invalidated. So, fine. We're going to get tons and tons of output because this machine refuses to give me my output. There we go. D7, D5. It's possible my definition of what en passant is is incorrect. So this move here, um, this move, D7, D5, rather. Why is this a thing? D6 is the en passant square. How... Oh, I should... Let's do this test again. Um, so this failed in the middle of search.cpp. Um, undo move d7, d5. Where there's a pawn on d6. The pawn got put back after an opposite capture got put back on this square instead of being put back here. That's... That's what happened, is that the engine at some point had simulated D75 pawn takes and then undid the pawn capture and expected this to be back here so it could move back. And it got placed back on the incorrect square. So, it's not that my definition's wrong, it's just that the pawn got put back on the wrong square. Um, else, move piece to comma from. Put the piece back at the source square. Okay, so this definition actually failed here. Um, so we can do another little trick with some of our debugging code to make it easier to find uh, uh, where something went wrong. We can indent our debugging code differently for um, pre start a function and end a function. So start a function is indented like with two spaces here. So here's the C5D6 revert. So after C5D6 was undone, this got put back here, uh, which is wrong. This needed to have been put back here instead. Um, um, is there not enough information? Type of moved piece is a pawn, and the destination square of the move is the EP square. Um, could add a printf statement here too.
if the type of moved piece is a pawn. Print standard error something. What do we want to print? Um, I guess two square. And we want to print also um, what the ampersand square if. Oh. Oh. The stack pointer might be pointing to a different place in this condition. Interesting. Um, right. For undoing a move, the stack pointer refers. Oh, I'm sorry, you can't see the Lee Chess diagram. Um, so yeah, what had been done was this capture while the pawn was on d5. And when we undid this capture, we have an opposite square right there. The way we check if the move is opposite, can't look at the current stack pointer. It needs to look at the previous stack pointer. Um, or just recognize that, like, hey, if we did a pawn capture and our two square was an opposite, well, how do we check that? We need the stack pointer. That's the problem. What if we don't have it? <laughs> All right, so yeah, this function's useless. Um, in this, uh, in this particular context, this function is useless. Welcome. Hello. Uh, yeah, so... If... Mm. Capture square is equal to 2. How do we get the pre... Oh, here we go. ST previous... What is st previous an object of? Uh, well, that's ugly. Um, what I was trying to ask is what's the type of st previous? Where is previous defined in the data structure? It's a state info object. What's the correct way to access them? Well, I mean, we saw just a couple lines below that how. Uh, attributes are being accessed. I was curious if state info had accessor methods defined or if I'm uh, supposed to... Yeah, okay, fine. There are no accessor methods here. Direct access is permitted. In fact, is done a couple lines right below. Right down here. Um, problem here is that we can't know if st previous is even defined before, well, I'm sorry, if we're undoing a move, we have to have a previous position to undo back to, right? Yeah, yeah, no, there is a previous thing that's always defined. Or at least it's... You can always set it. Um, you might not actually find anything there, but we should find something. All right, let's build this. See if it compiles. See if it runs. Should compile. Should run. But yeah, this. I mean, it'd be cool if we found a speed up that could apply to all versions of Stockfish. Um, so code golfing can be still interesting that way. Yeah, this is uh, the official Stockfish engine. All right, with a bunch of debugging code. Um, so now... Now we're going to comment out the debugger. Um, all right. Let's try that. 
So the move generator is unchanged. It never consumes the undo move function, so that was not a good test. A better test would be to see what I got is functionally equivalent without having to declare this. Oh, no, it's not. <laughs> we broke it. <laughs> um, the fact that we broke it might not be the worst thing ever. Um, uh, maybe in some sphere this could count as a simplification. Um, all right, so all our changes put together. We got rid of this ampersand constant that was defined in type types.h. Instead, defined a member of the position class called ampersand that uh, checks the same thing over and over and over again. Um, this should be a tremendous slowdown, but it should not be a functional change. And if this is a slowdown, we should be able to optimize it and see if we can get it to actually speed things up. But, um, yeah, if you had a pawn capture that uh, landed on opposite square, undoing it should put the pawn back on the correct square, and it does. Um, all right, so now I was going to look at search.cpp and see if these references to Ampassant could actually um, be treated the same way as normal moves. Decrease reduction in moves that escape a capture. Filter out castling. Okay. Now this static exchange evaluation greater than or equal to I think does, does not work with Ampassant moves. Let's skip down to this now. Due to not advanced pawn push, how is advanced pawn push defined such that it could even, uh, such that this could be an issue? The type of the move is a pawn, and the relative rank exceeds 5. Oh my goodness. Really? Really? Um, I mean, that's clever. Okay, so this assertion is still valid here. And it's only triggered during debugging anyway. Um, so it's only this condition in search that could potentially be removed. Filter out castling moves because they are coded as king captures rook. So stag exchange evaluation greater than or equal to. Uh, this was never designed with Ampassant in mind. Only deal with normal moves. Assume that other moves pass a simple stag exchange evaluation. Um, so we can add to this now. Uh, maybe that was our functional difference. So, yeah, okay, that was the functional difference. <sighs> We've produced something that's equivalent with fewer constants with probably a lot more uh, comparisons, a lot more memory accesses, whatever. This is probably far less efficient than the previous implementation, but it's an experiment. Um, there might be a way to improve this performance, and if so, improving this could improve over um, the official Stockfish code. Uh, so yeah, here we say, only deal with normal moves, assume other move types pass a simple stack exchange evaluation. 
Um, so if one is my special macro for I'm going to invoke some code and comment it out and re-enable it over and over and see how things function. Uh, what does reverse move do? Um, all right. So this just produces a move with the opposite to and from squares. Uh, wait. Well, that's pretty funny. Um, decrease reduction for moves that escape a capture. Filter out castling moves. So that was the intent of this type of move. It has to be normal. Um... But yeah, if we're going to do a reversing of a move and see if you had not made the move, is your position still good? Have we actually made... Uh, let's take a look at the diagram. So, this is not the correct position. Um... This should be white to play. D6 should be the opposite square. And the pawn should not be on rank 3, but instead 2 knight pawn. This should be 2 knight 1 pawn. And instead of 2 pawn 5, this should be 2 pawn pawn 4. There we go. Wait, really? Not valid. Do explain. Uh, I'm not... thought I did this correctly. Two knight, one pawn, etc. Two pawn, pawn, four. This looks correct to me. Okay. I've managed to move this forward. White... King, queen, king, queen. D6, zero, six, right? I should be able to indicate D6. Is, okay, now I could indicate D6 is the opposite square. Whatever. So if we're considering undo move here, um, in the context of a search, we'll put the pawn back here to attempt to evade capture from other pieces. Uh, why would they even do this? Let's see. See deeper when a piece flees. Yeah. So decrease the search reduction. So if a piece is trying to flee a capture by way of a... Where are we? Capture promotion. Reduced search depth. So this per after making the move. Okay, so the key here is that the move's already been committed to the board. We're gonna see had you did a null move or done a null move instead of doing the move. Um, was the null move terrible? And if the null move um if not playing this capture in this case but whatever kind of move you're making if this move you'd made uh, if your move does not evade capture under the SEE rule here um, then mm-hmm <laughs> Oh, this is interesting, too. I don't know that we need the special check for Opposant here. 
It is true that this static exchange evaluation is going to be messed up by the fact that you just sent it an opposite move. Actually, no, it's not. And the reason we know it's not is because we just changed the definition of static exchange evaluation. Um, we changed that here to say if you're dealing with an opposite move, just return is zero exceeding whatever threshold got passed into the function. So the threshold that got passed in here is the implicit value of a threshold. Uh, and the implicit threshold value is zero. So if we go back to this over here, we're checking if your move type uh, is not normal, or if it's en passant, is the threshold at least zero? And it is. So this is always going to return true in the case where we come from this context over here. Uh, where was it? En passant. This function's always going to return true. Um, so adding this condition in, uh, since this function always returns true and we have a negation right before it, this condition always returns false. This never gets executed. Adding this line in here has no impact because this also returns false in the case where we're dealing with an opposite move. So that's just a line of code that doesn't need to be there that has no functional impact at all, just from a static evaluation point of view. Um, futility, pr oh right. Yeah, so this assertion's not even necessary, um, but it's still there. Whatever. Not even sure why they had that condition defined. Uh, so this is the only line of code I changed here, and I only had to change it because this constant was already defined. And the reason this assertion was added is who knows. Um, but fine. There's no need for the assertion, right? That, this is gratuitous. Um, we're doing futility pruning. And we're checking, is this move an advanced pawn push? And if this move is a pawn push, or sorry, if this is not beyond the fifth rank, you can't be dealing with an opposite move. But... Um, there's no need for this comparison. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, is there anything in here that would suggest, like, any reason to check the move type? there anything that could possibly oh okay yeah futility value is equal to base plus the piece value of the piece on the two square okay so this is asserting that there's not going to be a piece on the two square because the piece you're capturing is technically not on the two square there is already a function captured piece in the position class that could be used here instead that deals with this very condition of I'm capturing a piece that's not on the two square. But rather than deal with that here, because they don't have to use that, um, because they're looking for not advanced pawn push moves, yeah, that's why this assertion's here. Because they were able to code golf or improve the performance by using piece on two square 
instead of calling all these other functions that call other functions, etc. So, and because this is part of this futility pruning, that's why they have the assertion to go with this. So it's not that there's some special problem with that. It's just they're asserting that if somehow you ended up in this block, two square is always going to be occupied by a piece. Which would have been a smarter way to write that assertion. Yeah, we're going to rewrite it. Um, uh, how do we assert that two square contains a piece? Because, well, honestly, um, I don't know. It's... I'm sorry, the reason they wrote it that way was actually for performance. Um, yeah, it's not empty two square. That's what they want to check. And they were being all cheeky writing it this way. Um, instead of something like this. Is there actually a function called empty on the position class? There is. Oh, check that out. Maybe they didn't have this function at the time they were writing the code. Um, Dang, it doesn't fit. Um, um, There we go. That's easier to read. Um, so opposant is not consumed anywhere in search.cpp. Uh, it's defined in position.h. And, oh, it is consumed in movegen.cpp. Why is it consumed in movegen? Why do we need it here? We need it to verify the legality of moves that could potentially put our king in check, even in one extremely special case. Um, I'll show the case, because it caught me by surprise during Atomic Chess programming a couple times. So, the super special case... Um moves in question might not necessarily be these. I'm just trying to think what's the easiest way to set this up. It's not super easy to set up, is it? Um, D4. Yeah, this is a lot easier with rook pawns being involved. Um, oh, hang on. This is not the right way to do it. D4, E5. We take here. 
Uh, queen g5 is eventually coming. Queen g5 has landed. Queen h5. Queen g5. This is the special case where the pawn is not pinned. But the ampassant move is illegal because it would put the king in check. Um, so that's the... In an atomic chess, you can sometimes ignore that. If if your ampassant move is actually checkmate, you can skip the fact that you're in check. So, yeah. And checkmate in the sense that it removes the opponent's king from the board. Um... So that's the special case that they're talking about here, where you have to check if your pawn move is uh, an opposite move. So, okay, search.cpp needs that to be defined. Position.cpp. Hang on. Position.h. So, down here in capture or promotion, um... Yeah, I could simplify this a bit. So if type of M is not normal or on passant M. That's disgusting. Um yeah, we'll leave this the way it is. Okay. Um I could invert the last two parts of this and perhaps should. Nah, it's, it's most readable this way. The compiler can optimize things on the same line however it wants to. Um, I think. I could be wrong. Um, so. Not sure why this is indented this strange way. Let's put it back. So, assert... If this is a capture, oh, yeah, so let's stick the en passant half of this first. Hmm. Oh, there's a parenthesis right before not empty. Fine. Oops, and here we require the move to be parameter. Um, all right, so those are all the references in that header file. This is a reference in legal. Uh, let's get back to that. That looks scary. This we could come back to in a minute. Um, this is fine. And there's probably no way to do it better. This function is pseudo-legal? No, gives check. So for gives check, we need to actually remove both pawns and put the pawn down and see if there's a check or not. Um, so there's no shortcut there. Um, you need to execute all this code. There's no shorter way about it. All right, here we're talking about captured... For undoing a move, we need to put a pawn back on the correct square, and we do put it back correctly. I'm oh, sorry, if we're doing a move, we need to remove the opposite pawn and indicate that we're going to remove it. So all that's done. Update board and piece lists. Oh, this is funny. Um, yeah, this condition still holds here. All right. Static exchange evaluation. This was a functional change without this line. Yeah, that's fine. Whatever. Um, that's slow, but... Alright, so is this the only one? We've skimmed through all the rest of these. 
go back up here. Pseudo legal. Oh, we could come back to this. Okay, so this one legal. Opposite capture legality checking. Okay, yeah, we explained all this. So back to the top of the file. We've already hit the top. Um, I'm sorry, we explained something similar. This one, likewise, to validate the legality of an en passant move, whether it puts your king in check or not, um, you need to actually simulate it out. So you have your king square, the capture square, the occupancy bitboard, etc. There's no shortcut here. So that's uh, necessary. So this is the only thing we could consider optimizing. We're pseudo-legal. Um, use a slower but simpler function for uncommon cases. Let me commit my changes this far and come right back here. Um, remove constant on assault. I don't really have any motivation to removing it or remove it at the moment, other than some hope that maybe someday performance will be improved by its removal. Such as, right here, um, for uncommon cases, use a slower but simpler function. Why? I mean, this historically has performed very well, but can we do better? Maybe. Um, so... PC here refers to the piece that we're moving. Pieces here refers to friendly pieces. Uh, so that all holds true. In the case of a pawn move... <laughs> yeah, so this down here needs to be slightly different. Um... So opposite uh, move is only legal if the capture square um, contains a pawn. So to do, hang on. Sorry if I'm bouncing around a bit. I'm just grabbing that code, sticking in my copy buffer. So here we can define this is a capture square. Uh, if, if the moves on passant is that, otherwise it's the two square. And like that. Oops. So with that, we no longer require this. As far as I know, because the function or the object, the pseudo legal function, is to verify everything basically other than does this put your king in check. Um. So. Yeah. Evasions generator takes care to avoid some kinds of illegal moves. So for evasive moves, for moves that try to get your king out of check, um, the legal move validator relies on certain kinds of validations already having occurred. But yeah, this should be fine. Um, There's the double push condition, etc. Else, if attacks bitboard type piece from pieces in two. Hmm. Curious. Oh, so for non pawn moves, we're checking does the non pawn uh, capture in the way that you're trying to move it? I'm sorry, does it actually move the way that you're trying to move it? Or are you like trying to move a knight like a bishop? Um, so. That's nice. Alright, 
let's see, do we have the same number of positions tested with all this updated code? Um, if so, we'll see whether or not the performance of this just sucks, but um, I suspect it does, and that's why it wasn't coded this way. Because the product that I ended up here with is reasonably readable. Oh, just kidding. Um, our code crashed. Uh, I guess we could run this with the debugger to see where it crashed. It crashed at search.cpp 1551. So, oh, well, that's amusing. Assert that the destination square of the move is an occupied square. Um, that's different, isn't it? That's different than what we were trying to assert earlier. Um, so rather than complicate this further, for now, let's put this back. Yeah, I wrote some code and didn't test it. That's what just happened there. And this testing is going much better. And exited normally. Yeah, so this is asserting, is the move not an advanced pawn push? That's different than checking, is the destination square not empty? Um, and the difference... Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, I'm just annoyed that this comparison here is going to be slow. Well, no. What I'm trying to check here cannot be done any faster. Because um, what I'm trying to check is here, are you moving a pawn? Arguably, the lookup of the moved piece could be a bit slow. Um, but are you moving a pawn? And if you are moving a pawn, then is it going to the opposite square? And the reason we need to do type of moved piece instead of type of piece on from square, the reason we need to write it out this way is because the moved piece could be the king participating in a chess 960 castling move, and type of king in that circumstance would be dereferencing a null value, I think. There might be some circumstance where type of piece on from square could be the empty piece, and that would crash. So, yeah, this is about as fast as this line of code can get. Um, I mean, there's really no reason for this comparison. Um, actually, what we're checking here, uh, two square move cannot be empty. Oops, all right. Uh, wait, okay, I guess both of my changes were in that same search.cpp file. I thought I had other edits, apparently not. Was it just search.cpp we were just looking at? I thought we were just looking at position.cpp and consumptions of this. I must have done get add already. Um, but yeah, we were looking at pseudo S P S E U D O legal. And we were checking does this here 
um, need to be so need to filter out Ampasa moves at the head of the function. And no, it doesn't. Um, so before we rerun the test, let's take the debugger out of the test. Rerun the test the normal way. All right. Let me check if I've missed any messages on Discord. Um, I am trying to schedule some Shogi matches this weekend. Uh, yeah, my opponent's usually available on Sunday, so we'll do Sunday. My tourney to master opponent, I have to figure out how to get them to reply. Uh, oh, that's interesting. We have a different result here. What did I change functionally that could have broken this? Um, where's my functional change? Was it the search.cpp change that's actually functional here? That accounts for such a large difference? Could be. That would be weird. Um, hmm. I mean, it's got to be one of these changes here. I would expect some removal indicated in red in this diff is somehow responsible. Um, yeah, that is so weird. There was that one thing in search.cpp we went back and forth and back and forth on do we need this or not? And I rationalized that we didn't need that. And maybe we did? No, that's not right. Um... I'm not doing any magic in my build script to, like, mess with neural networks or anything. Um, hmm. I mean, there are ways I could troubleshoot this. I just don't think... I assume that it's going to be easier for me to guess what the answer is than to um, troubleshoot this the way I should. So this is where I suggested that we don't need this thing. That this is just overkill. But we could add it back in. I mean, I had to add... No, that wasn't it. Um, where else could be it? Position.cpp? Normal? N-O-R-M-A-L? With capital letters? Um, well... Okay, let's try this. We won't know until we try it whether or not that's the regression. Okay, that is the regression, but how? 
How is this a functional change? Use a slower but simpler function for uncommon cases. That should return the same value as whatever we're returning at the end of this function, no? Uh, checkers, do some special stuff here. Um, I guess the legal move generator must be... Uh, I don't know. That's cool, though. Um, never would have guessed. That's really complicated. Uh, evasions check. So if we're in check, we have to be careful here. In case of king moves under check, we have to remove the king. All right, so if the piece type is the king, or not the king, if there are multiple checking pieces, it's necessary to move the king. That also holds true in the case of an odd passant capture. You cannot remove multiple checking pieces. I've given it plenty of thought. There's not a way that odd passant can remove multiple checking pieces. Um, our move must be a blocking evasion or a capture of the checking piece. So the problem here is that you could have a position where you could satisfy this and put your king in check a different way. But I thought these were validated in the function called legal, such they didn't need to be validated twice. Like here, this deals with if my move is an opposite. Well, this doesn't deal with evasions, does it? Evasions don't go through legal. Evasions are assumed to be legal and therefore don't go through this function. That's the deal. So even though this code here is rock solid, it just doesn't get invoked in whatever case it needs to be invoked in. So yeah, we have to keep this condition the same up here, which is a bit inconvenient because it means we have to generate all the legal moves every time we want to validate an opposite move. Um, I guess on the bright side, it means we don't need this block of code down here. And we can put this back. Wait, um, let's restore search.cpp, do another build, make sure we get the same benchmark result. And what we're going to find here is that this is not any kind of speed up at all, but um, depending on your perspective, you could call this a simplification or a complication. Um, so now we want to do our performance test. Um, so we got Stockfish Master already compiled. So to do our performance test, we... Where's my parallel? Oh, here it is. Bench parallel. For two iterations... Uh, hang on, we're going to stop fish test. We're going to run this for two iterations, see what we find. Run one of two. All right. Meanwhile, has anybody challenged my bot? I know you can't see my browser, but... Oh right, it's still in the middle of a game where it... It's the middle of a 0 plus 10 game where its opponent has not moved. Oh. Stockfish's bullet rating is increasing. There's no explanation for that. Okay, so yeah, this... Over two tests here... 
uh, we see this is a 1% slowdown as predicted. So the only way we could actually improve performance of this thing uh, the only way you could improve performance is by not calling the legal move generator every single time you want to validate a ampassant move, but somehow handling ampassant validation in line somewhere here. Um, so our initial thought was remove this over here and saying Where is this defined? Hang on. So yeah, our if our move is on percent, it's that. Otherwise, the capture square is that. But if we're dealing with a percent move, we also have to check that super special if the move is valid. Um, now there might be some other condition I missed here. Um, this is going to cause recursion almost certainly. Um, how is valid defined? How is legal defined, rather? If it's an opposite move, it does all these things and immediately returns. So actually, yeah, this... We don't need to define that function more than once. We could just reuse it. Um... Stick that up here. I'm not sure where best to put this garrison. It belongs somewhere, I just don't know where. Well, okay, before passing the move to legal, we should check if this like even looks like an ambassador move. So that's what this is doing. Alright. Um yeah, so that could be a speed up, in theory. In practice, probably not. All right, um, ep percent is perhaps not the right way to define that. Um, let's build it. We're gonna save the ice caps. The other thing I could check is GitHub to see this person who suggested the crazy, crazy patch in my initial perspective. Um, has he taken a look at my results? Uh, oh, he rewrote the header. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> good God. So he came up with another implementation. I'll take a look at that in a minute. Oh. Oh, interesting. Wait. Wait, wait, wait. I have to figure out what he's doing. Uh. To do. Sorry for the lack of showing you everything in the browser. I'm just trying to determine before I show you everything, is this going to confuse you? Oh. Okay, fine. Whatever. Um, so. Yeah, 
this is a 5% slowdown the way I've coded it now. So we took something that was a 1% slowdown and made it into a 5% slowdown. That's cool. Uh, and if we put this code back to the way it was and rebuild, we'll see our 1% slowdown again. So, uh, yeah. He had another interesting idea, which we'll get to in a second. Yep, there's our familiar 1%. So, got rid of a constant, removed some other code. This particular test is not in indicating a speed up. There could still be a speed up under real game conditions, but this test doesn't indicate a speed up. So this is where uh, he ended up with trying to improve this. Use a slower but simpler function for uncommon cases. So like here he's delegating the players in check. You don't need to generate all the moves, just the evasion moves. The player's not in check. You just need to generate the non-evasion moves. That's his perspective. I don't think he's taking a super close look at the definition of non-evasions. Because you'll note that non-evasions does not include promotion moves of certain types. Okay, wow. Oh, goodness. How did we get here? <sighs> really? Oh my goodness. Non-functional chain, yeah. All right, so whatever. Um, yeah, I tried this, but it seems uh, right. So he's pointing out here he aired. Um, this is my most recent attempt here. This one, I think, is the only one that has any chance of being accepted. Because this is... <laughs> Between a neutral change and a speed up, um, depending how you test it. Um, and since this is either neutral or strictly a speed up, uh, there's the only question is whether the added code adds too much complexity for developers to manage or a maintainer to keep track of. But yeah, this. Um, under first test condition was three tenths of a percent speed up. This was a zero percent speed up over more tests. We could do one more set of tests for 40 iterations, but, um, yes, yeah, so this is pointing out just by the way, this commit does not belong to this particular repository. It's over in my repository which this navigator is not showing. Um, so you need to actually navigate over to my username. And after you get to my username, you have to go to my project. I am showing the right screen. Yes. Okay. And then from here, you'd have to see I've got branches. Since I didn't initiate a pull request, it's not super easy to look at what I changed. Um, but this is what I ended up suggesting. So, yeah, there's the code change with respect to my copy of this repo. Uh, it's currently sitting on this branch that I've not yet deleted. Um, but out of all of our mad science, um, this is the only thing that survived every other version that tried to improve performance here failed. Um, also, yeah, um, mm -hmm. you rewrote the header, go take a look. So what's this fix order? All right. Fix order 
Yeah, so his big idea is that changing these lines of code, ultimately producing um, what he's got indicated here. This is his suggestion. Uh, I don't think the maintainers are going to accept that. Because uh, definition of non-evasions does not include all the moves. Um, if you actually look... I guess we're going to go there, because he wants us to. Um, if you take a look at move gen, um, like if you designed variants and had to code around this stuff, you would have some notion of what non-evasions represents. Generates all pseudo-legal captures and non-captures, but knight under promotions um, are dealt with separately somewhere. Where are knight under promotions dealt with? Under, yeah, promotions and under promotions. So if you're dealing with captures or evasions, there was some really stupid thing. Or just something that was maddening. That couldn't figure out for a while. But if you go either here or to move pick or somewhere, it's indicated what the difference is between evasions and non evasions. Um, yeah, we call them make promotions. Make promotions generates promotions. So if type is captures or evasions or non evasions, you get a queen. And potentially a knight. Um, if it's quiets or evasions or non evasions, you get a rook bishop or knight. So if you're generating evasive moves, that evasive move list is not going to include all the possible promotions. Um, what is this logic? Yeah. So what he's proposing might or might not be a functional change. Might or might not be a speed up. He, I don't know if he knows how to measure the performance of his own changes. Um, so that's why he's submitting patches to the cluster. But clearly he didn't look at my suggestion. That's okay. Why should I expect him to? Because, like, his suggestion wasn't super perfect. It was interesting. It was food for a lot of thought. It provided a value, an interesting experiment for us here that we toyed around with for far too long today. Um, but, yeah, ultimately, I don't think his patch passes because some of the nuances here that aren't documented. And you wouldn't know them unless you've been in this code before. Um, oh, hang on. Where evasions or non-evasions both generate all the possible promotion moves, just not in the same order that they're generated in the legal move generator. Maybe the ordering doesn't matter shouldn't matter. Um, but what's this? If it attacks BB Knight 2 and King Square, we generate a Knight. Oh! Oh, this was fixed months or years ago. People got tired of all the crazy insanity that was taking place in this method. So now we conditionally generate the knight up front if it's a checking move. And if promoting to a knight does not generate a check by virtue of the knight promotion, it gets generated last instead of up here. Arguably, this is still a stupid thing to do. Arguably, you should do queen, knight, rook, bishop anyway. Because you're never going to take a rook or a bishop. You'll always take a queen or a knight. Um... So if this knight attacks something else, you want the knight. You don't want a rook, you don't want a bishop. This is still stupid the way it's written. 
Not really, but it's confusing. It's overly complicated and probably yielding no benefit the way it's written. But if type is captures, yeah, captures is the thing here. If you have the type set to captures, you will generate a promotion to a knight that checks the king, and that'll be considered a capture uh, for quiet moves. I guess that's the reason this is different. It's because captures and quiets need a different subset of moves. But yeah, this code has been under so many different revisions. Um, really what they're needing to do here is say, if this is a check, then if the type is captures, append it. If it's not a check, if the type is quiets, append it. Um, so that's really what's kind of needing to be done. Um, the ordering in which this is done does not actually matter. Actually, this should be moved up. Just take these two lines, move them down to the bottom of this block. Always generate the knight before the rook and the bishop, and you're done. That would... Plus, the compiler could optimize this for, yeah, whatever. Um, it's just, yeah, I'm crying over spilt milk there. But that used to be much more confusing than it currently is. So what he submitted is actually valid. It might actually be a performance improvement. And perhaps a better one than my own. Hmm. Um. So, the last bit of magic here. Yeah, the problem with generating legal is that generation of evasive moves is going to be slow. Um, I don't know that there's anything special about non-evasive move generation that could take longer. Uh... Is there any reason non-evasions would be slow to generate for evasions, or just the whole legal move list to be faster? Um, for non-evasions, the target is... Well, okay, this is captures, right? No, this is generate all. Huh. Oh, okay, the target is everywhere we don't currently occupy. That makes sense. Wait, so how are legal moves generated that's so much slower than this partial move list generation? Oh, I'm sorry, here it is. It's actually documented way down here. Oh, this is quiets, though. This has nothing to do with evasions. Alright. So yeah, except checking night. So, yeah, whatever. Um... Oh, he took this block out of the legal move generator. Why did he do that? What's the point? So, he's generating evasions and non-evasions directly from that other function, bypassing this move validator that looks for pinned pieces. This is for purposes of pseudo-legal. So what he's generating are pseudo-legal moves, which... Huh. That's interesting. I've discredited this idea until now. Um... But yeah, effectively what he's doing is skipping one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines of code here and just saying, you know, just generate the loops. All of them. 
we'll leave it until later to check whether those moves are actually uh, putting us in check. But for now, if you're talking about castling or promotion or en passant, um, yeah, just generate the full move list and eventually somehow the move will get validated later. Um, that's that last part that huh, might or might not be correct. Um... Let's search for pseudo legal in .8, or header files. So it's only referenced once in the header file. It is referenced in the move selector move pick, and it is defined in position.cpp. So uh, we just need to check. Uh, this is crazy. But he might have cracked the code on this one. Or he could just be full of it, but we'll find out. The science is about experimenting and learning. So, um, move picker. If we have a transposition table move available to us, and it's pseudo legal, then our move stage is defined accordingly. Um, so is this only used... Okay, this is used to seed what move stage we begin from. Um, so this is just to select moves. And uh, special move types are not the only ones that can be illegal. If you have a transposition table move, uh, just because it's pseudo legal doesn't mean it's not, or doesn't mean that it is itself legal. You could have a move that is in general an excellent capture, but in this very specific position, could be putting your king in check. So. That's a really interesting concept that he came up with. Um, so where is the entire legal move list used other than that function? Okay, it's used in search and other places, so it's still used elsewhere. Um, let's try his patch. Alright, so... His patch is to go to where we're generating legal moves. And instead, conditionally, if we're in check, Generate some moves, otherwise generate other moves. Wow. Um, that could be simple. Let's compile that and test its performance. Yeah, that's thinking outside the box. So I was thinking at too low a level. Although I did try a number of high-level approaches, but I missed this one. Or rather, I thought about it and consciously rejected it because it seemed too risky. Uh, but, you know, if it works, it works. Um, and looking at the context that call this function, I don't see any reason why this would fail. Uh, that's a 1% speed up if it works. Probably should validate here that, yeah, we're still searching the same number of positions. 
We haven't changed the move generator. We just changed the move selector. So signature, okay. So we're testing the right number of positions. We're doing two test runs at a depth of 13. Okay, at this, with two test runs, we have a slowdown measured. It was the same test we did just a minute ago. This is why you have to do enough iterations to know whether or not um, you're within or with outside of the margin of error. Although that test run uh, had a margin of error of 167 milliseconds, or 167 nodes per second. But we had only two data points, so degrees of freedom were extremely high. Yeah, let's try four. Um, but realistically, we need to do 40 runs or something. I just want to see if this is even worth running for a ton of iterations. Uh, maybe. I think the problem he's running into is that um, the speculative... Wait. Uh, there is one super obvious thing he missed here. Um, so, yeah, let's add that in. You can't castle out a check. There's no reason if you're gen val well, this is perhaps gratuitous. You don't need to validate that that way. Castling moves would not be selected by this move selector most of the time anyway. Uh, even though castling is a good move, that's the reason the selector wouldn't pick this. It's because you're almost always going to play it the first time around. Um, you wouldn't leave a castling move hanging unless it were a bad move. So, you know, let's just do this for 40 iterations. I keep dilly-dallying trying to think if there's something I can improve before uh, testing this, but there's not. Um, see, so yeah, let's, I don't know, watch some games. I missed a phone call. I need to check that. Here we are. I'll be right back. Oh yeah, Maya had a... The, the Maya team did a blog post. Make sure to check that out. All right, we'll get that taken care of soon. Um, let's see, my tests are still running. It's entertaining to watch Maya play. Uh, so they have ten, or they have nine of these bots. <clears throat> Pardon me, they have nine of these that are trained to play like 1100, 1200, 1300, 1400, etc. Or at least that's the players' games that they were trained upon. Um, 
So this one was trained on games from players rated 1900. The fact that its own rating exceeds 1900 is just a testament to the hardware and or some skill or I don't know, but this one is tuned to try to play like a 1900, even if it does outperform that. That's not a fault of the algorithm, it's just what it is. But it tries to play moves, it tries to predict how a 1900 would play. Um, so, I know back in the 90s, Kasparov was like, he was claiming that Deep Blue played a human-like move. And every day we learn more and more what machines can do um, that previously they might not have been able to do, but now can. Yes, yeah, so Rook F1 was probably a mistake um, because it allows all these checks. And you could argue that Rook F1 is a human-like move. But I think Kasparov also went on to say, like, oh, the AI Deep Blue had played a sacrifice that uh, only humans would have played or something. I don't know exactly how he worded it. It's been too long. Um, but, yeah, now I think Frederick Friedel of Chessbase... Um, gave an interview saying that this kind of research, like what the Maya team is doing, is uh, one of the next challenges in AI to try to produce results that could be interpretable by humans. Uh, so you can make a convincing beginner. So yeah, there we are just hanging upon like a beginner or 1900 would. Making training tools for beginners involves some degree of being able to figure out how a beginner would play. So this is exciting research. Unfortunately, there's not a game corpus for other games like Shogi. Uh, otherwise, the same research could be done for that different uh, game. So, yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> Maya still wins. So... Just because it plays human-ish moves doesn't mean that... I oh, hit the wrong button. Doesn't mean that it's going to lose all the time. So... Interesting. Now... Okay. Yeah, I'm not even seeing any trend here. Out of the top ten... At first, this is performing better, but there is that minus 4,000 and a plus 5,000 here. So if I take this 10 by 10, if I look at the last 10, um, yeah, there's not actually any trend here. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, the margin of error here, it's, well... Yeah, the margin of error exceeds the measurement by several orders of, or by one order of magnitude. So I need to report back to him my results. I thought this is really clever on his part, but ultimately I guess it doesn't. Oh. Okay, so he did amend this explanation here. Yeah. I didn't get anything. It's not possible to review regression. He's correct. Right. So he's not incorrect here. Um. Yeah, second was an incomplete move, Jen. Uh, this whole message is rewritten. Yes. He's not wrong. <laughs> uh. For the iterations, depth equals 13, memory equals 16 megabytes, and, um, yeah, 
Uh, so it's unfortunately um yeah that was really clever but it's sadly it's just not coming up as an improvement so um what this means is that almost all moves generated no i'm sorry it means that the legality checker um does not fire on most moves and on moves where it does end up firing um it's extremely fast um so yeah i mean that's the result um so he still didn't look at my proposed patch um so mine was just you know at this one condition right before you're going to go generate all the moves don't bother calling the move generator in the first place if you don't need to use it um so that's where we settle i do like his concept of a partial move generator but uh, incomplete move gen. How did that perform? Come on. So this failed at a long time control. This was how it was attempted. So generate uncommon pawn moves, etc. Generate uncommon. You had to generate it make an uncommon phase so yeah i mean it's clever um this increases the size of the executable this might affect the branch predictor in difficult to understand ways so uh yeah it's, it's got a nice idea um um so that's disappointing but it is what it is i thought his idea was actually really clever but it just isn't enough of a result to matter. Um, and I'm tempted to just run this one more time. Uh, so to run this, I would have to go over here, get check out on passant writes, get diff. Yeah. So let's undo his change so I can check out my change. We could take a look at it again. Run this for 40 iterations and see if the performance suffers or not. Um, so. Yeah. I mean, redoing this test is not going to tell us a whole lot. Even if somehow, over 40 iterations this time, if it performs better than last time, like, we have to set a threshold somewhere. Um, so how's my tuning thing going? Oh, where did my tuning thing go? Here it is. 2,800 games played. Got all these parameters. If we take a look at them one at a time on this graph, this is the one I was most curious about. Apparently, as all the other parameters are being tuned, this one fluctuates. Um, oh, at the constant for what's this called? Confined king. It's being tuned upward. Having your king confined in the middle game is apparently bad. 
having it confined in the end game is apparently not so bad. Threatened or threats to capture opposing pieces apparently are between 81 and 80. That's not a lot of variation. Um, threat uh, by capture, capture threats in the end game are a little bit more, or not as severe actually. Um, for whatever reason. So. Yeah, I might have goofed up here. Oh wait, no, this is the middle game value of a pawn. This is the middle game value of a black pawn. So these are, they should have the same shape or similar shape, but they don't. That can't be helped. End game value of a pawn should decrease. So I need to fix my tuning to like treat white and black pieces the same. Um, Otherwise, we're going to have some really interesting tuning results that are difficult to make sense of. Well, I could just average together the white and black piece values, but um, this is just so strange. But yeah, this value of um, skip most of the evaluation because one player has a material advantage is varying between... Uh, 1565 and 1554. That's not a lot of variation. Um, this looks more like this. When you consider that these lines, these numbers are basically right next to each other on a number line. You don't need to see all these squiggles in between. But yeah, there's still 7200 games left to be played for this tuning. So we'll find out later how that performs. Uh, is my test done yet? 36. Not done yet. What else can we do to stall for time? Um, yeah, so he ignored my change. I commented tersely on his. But um, I'm not sure what the merit of his change is, given that the machine, given that my tests indicate that there's not any merit to it. Should I believe my tests? I think so. Um, oh yeah, so unfortunately, because somebody's actively playing my bot, I can't go challenge it right now. Um, but yeah, I did manage to defeat it at Atomic earlier, but it's currently using the neural network values that might be holding it back a bit in variance until we've got time to tune all things. So I should submit more tests uh, like the one I submitted that tune some parameters. I need to do this for all the variants. Now that the graphs are actually responsive, um, Instead of just having the variables float in place, now they're now the variables actually vary throughout the course of a test, which means that it is uh, the results are impacted by the changes in those uh, parameters. Is this done yet? It is done. So yeah, we ran mine again. So this time. My test result is still within the margin of error. Note 1692 is within that um, twice 1028. So that's not a significant result uh, with n equals 40. Um, you could add this to my previous result, which was also insignificant. In this case, adding the two would not produce a significant result. Um, because the other one was basically zero plus or minus zero. So adding that to this is not going to change anything. Um, uh, or rather summing this base distribution here with the other base distribution we had earlier, this test distribution, etc. like, and then doing the math still with the other one being so close to zero plus zero difference, um, 
you're not going to notice a more pronounced effect from doing an addition here. If you had this same distribution 10 times and you were to sum this 1692 plus or minus, the, well, I'm sorry, if you were to sum this times 10, this times 10, this times 10, this times 10, well, not times 10, times the square root of 10, square root of 10, whatever, like you'd actually see that this would start to exceed the margin of error. If you are consistently pulling ahead of the margin of error over lots and lots of iterations, then it's considered an improvement. Um, but yeah, like this is the proposed change. This, it's implausible that my change here could be a slowdown. Like, this operation of check this one element that's on the move object that's like an instantaneous access for something you've already checked can be, um, the compiler can optimize that through predictive commoning. This variable that had been accessed at the top of the function already um, could be compared to this one thing that could be looked up. Um, this lookup could be the slowest part um, because it will require a pointer dereference. So we have one pointer dereference as compared to this entire freaking method um, or function. Like, this single dereference, uh, ampassant square, have we, let me take a look at the contents of this position.cpp. Uh, so, have we dereferenced other things already, potentially? Side to move is already in our position class. From square has been dereferenced. To square has been dereferenced out of the move. The move obviously has to be dereferenced. Um, well, it's not even a reference, but it has to be accessed. And the moved piece has to be computed because almost always this function will need this value computed, so go compute it up front anyway. Um, so, hmm. yeah, this is Stockfish. This isn't even my multivariant Stockfish. This is me just trying to take the base stockfish and find a way to prevent the ice caps from melting. Um, and I think I found a solution. And it's a one-line code change that's pretty easy to understand, um, in my opinion. The, pin, uh, the maintainer's opinion might differ. But yeah, if I just, before we try to generate the entire move list, for this extremely common use case of we're generating an opposant move, um, check if the destination square of this move of, that we got out of the transposition table, check if the destination square is equal to the opposant square, if there is an opposant square. So there's two cases where this could be illegal. One where you had an opposant move, you chose not to do it, and now you're going back and saying, you know, look, okay, we transposed into a similar position, or like this opposite move's great in general. I want to try playing it again. And no, if you passed on it, you don't get to play it next turn. That's extremely common. Also common would be um, if um, you are. Uh, We've reached this position through some other transposition means and the transposition key has not considered the fact that um, the move order well I'm sorry if you reach something by transposition almost always the opposite 
aspect of that position will be different. So, yeah, those are two cases. One where you didn't play it, and then the next move you're trying to play it because in general it was a good move. And the other case where you reach a position by transposition, and it's just not available in that move order. Um, so both of those are very common things in chess. Humans have to deal with that all the time. Why shouldn't stockfish? Yeah. Um, you know, you're probably right. Yes. And initially I had been trying to code golf to take this entire move list legal and strip it out. And that was not feasible. Um, but I don't actually know if it's possible to say that you're code golfing for performance or just optimizing for performance. But yeah, what we ultimately ended up trying to do is optimize for performance because my earlier attempt, which removed lots of lines of code, ended up being a 1% slowdown. Um, so we found a solution here that actually didn't involve any golfing at all. Um, and it is, um, well, it's a speed up, but within the margin of error, no matter how many times I run this. And I don't want to leave my computer running all night. And if I can't get this to measure a significant improvement in 40 iterations, it's really not worth running it over and over and over again. Um, I've done this twice with 40 iterations. The first time it was basically zero difference. This time it's a 1,892 notes per second difference with a margin of error of 1028. So still this is considered noise. Um, but like, there's no way that this single EP square evaluation here Let's look at the definition of EP square. EP underscore S-Q-U-A-R-E. There's no way this definition, which involves taking a pointer and dereferencing it, like, this is a really simple thing to do. Um, this EP square could have been loaded into some register I'm sorry, this ST object could have been loaded into a register already, or it could be very easily accessible. Um, because if you're checking if a move is pseudo-legal, you're probably doing something with move generation. You probably have the present state of the position available to you very easily. So the compiler could probably optimize this further if I do profile-guided optimization. But even keeping that aside, this one dereference is going to be like so much faster in cases where you don't actually need to call generate all legal moves. Um, so this is my best attempt. Another developer's best attempt. Sorry for the blinding screen here. They tried several things. They submitted several things to the ver or the Stockfish not variant test cluster. This is their best attempt so far. They made some big English description of why they think this is a good thing. I read it. I agree with it, but that the evidence doesn't support the theory. So he's right. It can't be a slowdown. It's just not an improvement. So you could take my code, which is an improvement, or might be an improvement, um, or you could take this, which is provably not a slowdown, but doesn't seem to be helping. Um, two different schools of thought there. So I let him know my results on my machine. Other people can try out his patch, see if it works or not. Um, But yeah, I wonder if and when maintainers say something about his thing. Maybe somebody in this entire chain will look at this because um, 
it works. Maybe, maybe not. But yeah. My thing is not provably um, strictly, I don't know. What's the word for strictly not worse? I don't know. But, um, yeah, this thing could potentially be bad that I'm submitting. But potentially it could be really epic, too. So hopefully some official stockfish dev will eventually take a look at it. Or when they close his poll request, I can bring this up and say, hey, guys, what about this? So, um, yeah, another thing is I tried some hybrid of his pat. Well, I didn't even try it. But another thing that could be attempted is take his suggestion. And if the player's in check, then, um, then verify that M is not a castling move. Um, but realistically, the context which call this would not often involve a castling move getting passed into this function. Um, yeah, the move generator, or the move selector, rather, would not usually be called in a way that would call this if the player were already in check. Actually, that's probably the key insight here. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's funny. Now that I'm trying to explain it aloud, this pseudo-legal thing is principally used, actually it's only used in movepick.cpp, and it's used to figure out what generation, or which stage you are at in move selection. There's a whole bunch of rules about if you're in this stage, select moves this way, if you're in that stage, select moves this other way. And so you can, sometimes when you're selecting move, you have this move available through the transposition table, TTM, TT move. I don't know what the data structure is that clearly, but when you have a TTM, you can check whether or not the TTM is pseudo-legal. So you can have a move that's probably the best move. That's a candidate you want to consider when you're trying to figure out what move to look at next. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, I guess it's possible to be in check in quite a few of these things, but being in check influences the phase that you end up in already. Um, but, I seem to remember somehow that search has some interesting interaction where you're, if you're in check, yeah, in check, like a lot of things happen very differently in this function if you're already in check. And move generation is also affected if you're in check, so. Uh, I think if you're in check, there's just not as many accesses of the TT table. I think. Yeah, the search depth is altered. Like, a lot of things are done very differently if, if a check is in play. Yeah, here we are. Evaluate the position statically at the beginning of Q search. So if you're doing quiescent search, which... If there are checks, odds are you're probably in here. You're doing quiescent search. You do a static evaluation. Otherwise, if there's a transposition table hit, you do all this fancy stuff with the TT value. So basically, um, I don't understand this code very well, but yeah. Um, a static evaluation is done very differently in the case where you're in check versus where if you have a TT hit and you're not in check. A lot of things are done very differently. So trying to optimize this pseudo move thing for a very exceptional case that does not happen most of the time 
And even in cases where it does happen, optimizing it probably doesn't matter that much. Doesn't seem like the evidence supports this is worth doing. Um, so this would be more worth doing, perhaps, if uh, non-evasions somehow performed significantly better than legal. Uh, oh, that's the other insight here. It's that move list legal. If you actually go to move gen dot cpp uh, source move gen cpp where'd it go down here. If you look at the definition of legal, as he pointed out in his pull request. Uh, it's he took some small slice of this and said, you know, we can skip this whole block. And the, in theory, that sounds great. In practice, how many positions have a pinned piece? If you're considering moves out of a transposition table, like if you're looking at an opening position and you got to a position two different ways, um, how often are your pieces pinned to the king? If you're dealing with a middle game position, how often are your pieces pinned? Most of the time, pinned pieces come in, are in effect, or when one king is already imperiled and might be in check already. Um, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. My chatty window is not scrolling down there. I am sorry that's not showing up. Although, even though... Uh, there we go. Finally it shows. I'll have to be more careful with my keyboard shortcuts in the future. Um, yeah, Windows D, or Logo D, messes things up there. Um, so... Uh, yeah, he's correctly observing we don't need to do any of this. But in most positions, pieces are not pinned. In most positions, you're not, by transposition, considering moving the king. And in most positions, your candidate transposition move is not en passant. And even if it is, like... Generating the entire move list just to verify that Ampassant is not, in fact, legal anymore. It's not the end of the world. Um, so, yeah. Oh, plus, another overlap. Uh, so pinned here... I'm confusing myself. It's checkers here that... Um, So yeah, there will be quite a few positions where there's at least one pinned piece. Um, wait. Hmm. Yeah, I'm just confused. So the observation here is that there's, if there's even a single pinned piece, even if it has no relation to the piece that you're currently moving, we still need to validate every move. Interesting. Huh. I guess that must be optimal somehow. So, if there is a pinned piece, every move gets validated regardless of whether or not you generated all the moves, but... Uh, I guess legal is kind of expensive for a function. But yeah, there's some explanation as to why, in general, this particular block of code, um, it, its performance doesn't matter. Um, I think the simplest explanation is that most positions, you don't have a pinned piece, in most positions, you're not moving your king multiple times. In most positions, you're not going to see opposite. So, even the most 
optimistic. Um, like if you were to say 1% of positions um, involved one of these factors. And then you were to say further that this code improves by 1% in performance by skipping this. Um, so you're talking about some really negligible performance gain in that kind of circumstance. So I think that's the obstacle he's facing. But without actual data, it's hard to know. He's right that you don't need to call this, but and this is all logical and whatever, but the data doesn't support uh, actually doing this change. It's not even close in my test, but my test could be flawed. If he could show some other kind of test demonstrating a performance improvement, that'd be great. Um, surprisingly, his patch randomly passed on a short time control. I don't understand how. Um, yeah, that's just very surprising to me that that actually did pass here. But so he does have some evidence to support his idea, but I just think this is noise here. I don't know what this, what else this could be attributed to. I mean, do some, he could resubmit this to the cluster and see whether or not it fails STC, I guess. STC is supposed to be used as a measure to think of like what things are worth submitting for a longer time control. This isn't itself supposed to be... Um, well, I'm sorry, there is one circumstance where this measurement does matter, and that circumstance is where you think there's some scaling consideration where it has to pass both tests to be accepted. But in general, this is just used to suggest what things are worth running with lots of computing power. Um, so I don't see any reason why this, why scaling would be a large consideration for this particular thing. Um, yes, these are, well, I'm sorry, fishnet's the wrong word. This is done on the fish test cluster. Fishnet is Lee Chess's thing. Fish test is, um, this software. It's still done on a cluster of computers. It's just not affiliated with LeechS. Uh, so yeah, and then there's the fish cooking forum where they usually discuss this sort of thing. You don't see too many comments on GitHub. By the time things have gone from that forum through some number of tests, through their Discord, and finally passed the tests, and then they make their way to GitHub, that's when I start taking a look at some of these things, just so I can know what's coming down the pipe. Um, and originally what was patched here uh, had me very concerned. And this is much milder, but also this has no benefit, or no measurable benefit on my PC. So this is not going to pass, uh, despite passing the short time control test. Um, other people could try like measuring the nodes per second with and without this patch. Um, they'll probably replicate my result, is my guess. Um, yeah, it's a really clever idea, and I wish it worked. But there just aren't enough positions where uh, this kind of performance change matters. Um, the branch that's added here, it's just, it's a branch that's otherwise normally taken, and um, it's really the branching that outweighs the block that's below this. 
So the incorrect branch predictions here are what are super costly. And there's just no way around that. Um, I tried to write code that used fewer branches. Um, they had fewer if statements. By not generating the full legal move list as frequently. Um, and my attempts to reduce the amount of branching um, didn't quite work. Um, well, I would remove a branch in one point of code and have to add it somewhere else. So there was really no way to simplify this unless you could like remove an entire move type. And I did remove the ampassant move type and patched all the code and observed a slowdown anyway, because computing whether or not a move is an ampassant move is expensive. So, um, and then I tried like having, um, only going into this block of code for generating legal moves if the move's a castling move and handling all the rest of the pseudo legal move validation um, without move generation. But that was not helpful either. Um, I guess one thing I didn't test was um, generation of non evasions instead of, well, like. That's okay. The compiler could not prove that non evasions would always get called here. Um, that's an interesting thought. And since we have a minute, might as well try it out. I'm not optimistic. Um, so git check out castling move rights. Git diff. This is my earlier test. So I'd say if the move is a castling move, do this other comparison before calling move list legal. Um, so I had some other implementations that did not call move list legal unless we had castling move um so let's break this up we're actually adding a branch here now type i mean this is a branch i've already added in a different way but this is equal to castling um we're going to return the first half of this which is can we castle and do non-evasion moves include this? Actually, that doesn't improve anything. Before uh, if we're in check, yeah, trying to generate non-evasions is not going to help anyone. So the thing we really want to do is that something I've already tested is if the move type is castling uh, something like this. This is what I've already tried. This doesn't work. You'd think it would, but there just aren't enough positions where a player tries to castle out of check for that to make a difference. Um, yeah, this sort of thing where, like, um, often if you have a castling move, it gets prioritized very highly, and you don't put it off. I mean, yeah, you will look at other possibilities, especially if you could check your opponent's king. But if you're putting off a castling move, you're not going to revisit it anytime soon. Um, so it's really this diff here. This is the one that has the greatest potential to work. Because there's so many cases where, oh, I put off on passant by a move, and it's a great move in general, and I just can't play it anymore. Or I reach the same position through two different move orders, and now it's no longer legal. These two possibilities um, are pretty common. So 
Yeah. Sorry I got carried away. Um, What's the relevance of knowing whether a move is castle or ampassant or pin? Uh, yeah, so we're talking at this point about uh, move gen. Uh, so we're talking about move, not move pick, move gen. That's B. Uh, looking at legal. So yeah, the significance of this block of code. So if you're moving the king, you need to ensure that you're not putting your king in check because you could have played a castling move, I think. I think that's the notion here. So if you've moved your king, um, two different ways you might be putting your king in check. One is if you're already in check and trying... No, actually, no. Evasions handles that right. If you're in check and you're trying to run away from the checking piece, that is handled correctly. But yeah, if you're castling, um, you do need to verify that the castling move is legal. Um, if the type of the move is en passant, then... Uh, I did briefly cover this earlier, but Ampassant removes two pawns from the same rank. And therefore you need to verify whether or not your king is suddenly in check because two pawns were removed from the same rank. If there's a pinned piece, why do we need to check if your move is legal? I guess if you're generating a non-evasive move, if you're not in check, you accidentally put yourself in check by playing a non-evasive move. I think that's the idea. Um, so there's, I think, the three ideas. I could be mistaken. There could be additional complications which require this comparison. There's not any comments here. Um, comments might help. But probably would not because this is like the middle of several other routines. They're all pretty complicated. Wait, no, legal, yeah, legal move generation is used also by move pick, right? Rep, word, legal, start FCP. So here's end game. Yes, yeah, so it's not just the move. It's not just search that uses this. It's not just like the pseudo legal function that's also called through move pick that uses this. This is used several places. Um, so legal is because it has so many different contexts. I think that's perhaps why people are afraid to document the reasons for these particular lines of code because the comments could be incorrect. Um, while in general that drives me mad that like the potential for an incorrect comment could um make somebody afraid to comment something um while in general that's a problem here like this uh there's so many consumers of this that it's just very difficult to document what's going on here, which is sad. Thankfully, there are lots of tests in this code base. So there's like all kinds of is okay this and position is okay that and assertions strewn everywhere in the code. So there's a lot of tools to help um, overcome the fact that there's not great documentation on this particular function. Uh, is Ampassant different from a normal discover check or discover double check? Um, so what takes care of those cases with a normal discovered check? Um, so a normal discover check against your own king is handled by pinned here. If any of your pieces are pinned to your king, um, we can look at the... Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not going to look at the definition of blockers for king right now, but 
it's defined that if an opponent has a bishop, rook, or queen, and your piece is pinned directly to your king with no other pieces in between, that's considered to be a pin. Um, just take my word on that if that's okay, but if you have a pinned piece, um, you can't accidentally discover a check on your own king because position.legal validates whether or not uh, you just discovered check on yourself, and if so, um, your this cur pointer is removed from the move list. Um, so that's how that's handled. Uh, how is ampassant different? Is the other part of your question? I'll put up the diagram. Uh, so, leeches analysis. Um, let's see. I did this wrong. No, I actually haven't messed it up just yet. Uh, let's put the king over here somewhere. The king over here somewhere. So this is how um, Passant is different. Um, this is why um, Passant needs some special logic. Because your pawn is not pinned, but you can discover check on your own king. Uh, otherwise, there could be some super clever way that would detect, hey, I'm capturing this piece on a different square, and therefore um, just do the single comparison some other way. But yeah, here you actually need special code to handle this particular case. Yes, that's the difference. Yeah. Interestingly, you could look through their commit log. I forget if or when this came up. Um, I'm trying to remember if this... There was some repo where this ended up being an issue. Um, I think it might have actually been Stockfish where they missed this and had to go fix it, which is just amazing, given their tremendous record of quality. Um, this is a very uncommon thing, but it was still an oversight, and seeing them, uh, all the brightest minds of the project collaborating and explaining this and trying to figure out what's the best way to handle this without uh, producing a big performance hit. That was interesting. Yeah, I might be mistaken. It's more likely that I'm mistaken than they actually messed up, but on the other hand, this is a hard thing to test for, so yeah. I think, uh, well, they've done a ton of refactoring of their code, constantly improving performance of it. So, and they have a lot of really rigorous tests, and I think that's how this eventually got discovered, through some assertion that um, this eventually popped up. Um, but it wasn't immediately obvious what happened, and then they figured it out. Um, so this is the one exception that's why it has to have special handling but yeah this, this I liked the developer's theory on his most recent rewrite of his message it's just the test my test doesn't seem to bear out that this uh, removal like okay yeah this this exchange is one line for two lines, but uh, this one line used to call some other lines that are no longer being invoked. So this removal in that sense just does not measurably improve performance, as far as I can tell. Um, 
Whereas my change, my proposal is a bit riskier um, and may or may not improve performance. But I cannot imagine this being a serious degradation. I think in my mind here, the only question is, um, is the one third of a percent potential improvement in performance worth the challenge in being able to read this code because that's the other thing that the maintainers pride themselves on is this being this code base being readable um, and easy to contribute to and if they accept this what's the next developer going to contribute the next developer is going to come in here and say "Ooh, if the move type is castling we need to verify that the castling is even permitted for this color um and okay that could be handled separately but the maintainers need to have some policy about what they take and what they don't take and the maintainer has some discretion over that so i'd like to see him take this it'd be cool to be credited with hey this person uh, helped us improve performance of uh, this for millions of users but um my tests don't bear that out either. My tests say this might be an improvement, but I can't actually measure more than a 0.3% with a larger than 0.3% margin of error. Um, but in my mind, like this type of is already available through predictive commenting. Uh, two is already available through predictive commenting. Like that's declared at the top of this method. It's already been accessed. EP square does require a dereference of a pointer that's done so many other places in the application. That dereferenced pointer value could still be sitting in a register on the CPU. So, or it could be easily available somehow. So, yeah, this line of code could never degrade performance unless you have some really funky architecture. Um, so yeah, once they do comment on their policy and his thing, I'll see what they think about mine. Um, but yeah, I, I think the trade-off here is readability for performance. And I think this is, despite lack of evidence, this must be an improvement. Because generating all the legal moves, just to find out that Ampassant's no longer legal, probably messes with the branch predictor, and didn't need to be done in the first place. Because you could easily find that, hey, I'm trying an Ampassant square, or move with the wrong square, or there is no Ampassant square, or... What I'm trying is no longer an opposite move. Well, I'm sorry. Um, if it's no longer... I'm sorry. If it was an opposite move, and this position no longer has the square, or the position has a different opposite square, um, that'd be kind of funky if it had a different opposite square, but the situation for that would be some crazy stupid position... Um, that looks, well, it's less convincing this way, isn't it? Let's try this from a clean slate. It's more convincing this way. Granted, you're not going to have some crazy position like this, but if you did, like the check Benoni, the Alpassant score could be either of these two, uh, depending on the move order you got here through. Um... So, hypothetically, this is extremely uncommon, but yeah, um, I shouldn't even bother arguing this point. But you could have the same position, end position could have an opposite square that differs from the to the destination of your move. But more likely, a certain situation where this would matter would be just like if you observed that, hey, I've got this move and it tends to be awesome, 
and it'd be great if I could play this in some other position, and this move just is not available. It's like, there's Ampasant. And let's say you had some completely different position. Um, let's see. How do I even do this? Um... Well, I guess here, this would still be legal. But my point is just that, like, just because the transposition table gives you this move, that's great. Um, yeah, the pseudo-legal move validator can also handle, you know, if you played some completely other sequence, um, the move you're wanting to play might not be available in this particular position. Yeah, like there, you could no longer do um, this. Maybe this here. It's a bad example, but I'm sure stuff like this happens more regularly than stuff that we've been looking at a minute ago. I just can't get enough of these positions, um, no matter how I seem to test it. But this one pointer D reference cannot possibly outweigh benefit of skipping this whole damn thing. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, I've been stalling and trying to explain things quite a bit, but I am curious what the official Stockfish team will say. Since I shared my test result, he's shared a delightful explanation. And it's all logical, it's just there's no evidence to support it. So... Um, I think they'll be concerned after looking at this. They won't want to look at my suggestion unless some other developer gets on board with it. But there's not enough evidence to support my suggestion either, so what kind of sane developer would support me? Anyway, this is an interesting optimization endeavor. Um... Really, there are two points to this. One, to see, like, to sharpen my skills, but two, to see, could potentially something enormous that refactors half the code base be coming down the pipeline? Um, and if so, can I get ahead of it? And the answer is no. Any kind of drastic change, like what I attempted, um, where I got rid of the Ampassant lag altogether, I'm sorry, I got rid of the move type. You don't need a move type for Ampasant. It's just performance-wise beneficial to have it. Uh, did I even bother publishing this to GitHub? I don't think so. I think I only have it locally. Yeah. It was that bad that I don't even publish it. That's funny. Um... Maybe I can briefly show it here one last time. But I should be wrapping up. Get branch dash v. Yeah, there it is. On dash facade. Let's push it, even though it's dumb. For science's sake. Um... So if you compare that to the master branch, yeah, lots of red and green here. We've been over this before. I want to go to bed, so we're going to not closely look at it. And just gloss over all of it, but the main concept is... Actually, I got this comparison backwards. Master versus on passant. There we go. So I got rid of this flag and then fixed all the compile errors, and it's a 1% slowdown. And my attempts to improve on that did not improve. And if they had, somebody else would have beat me to the punch. So, um, but yeah, the trick to making this code change so much easier was to, to find a convenience method that had the same 
return value as, or the same evaluation as type of m equals ampersand. Just make a function that does the same thing. And the way it's done is in position.h. Checking is the destination square of a pawn move, uh, the ampersand square if there is one. So yeah, uh, the one thing that's a bit impure about it is the notion that uh, the EP square could be undefined, or it could be defined as square none. But um, I don't think it's ever undefined, I think it's always just square none. So we'll see where this goes. I've had enough fun looking at this for now. Um, Still on the horizon is me trying to troubleshoot this screen vibrating thing with Leeches. Somebody else had linked to this on the forum. Um, they'd uploaded an image of this. Sorry about the strobing. You get the idea. So, oh, they did that with puzzles. That's interesting. So I only observed this at the game board, but they observed this with puzzle mode. Um, I think this just affects 720p displays, but I said I was eventually going to test other browsers, and I am, eventually. Um, we'll get back to that. Uh, let's see. And then I want to upgrade my chatbot to PhantomBot 3.4, or if they produce a new one, I want to upgrade it to that instead. Although the release notes don't provide a compelling reason for me to upgrade other than the code's a little simpler and maybe lighter on the system. Um, oh, you can't see my GitHub stuff anyway. Sorry, I'm not thinking clearly. Um, should we test one last thing before we go? And this has nothing to do with Stockfish. Wait. Oh, I'm not even in the right directory. All right. Um, yeah, it's CD Lee Shogi and pull on the master branch. Um, no changes on the master branch in the last few hours. Uh, so yeah, my remote master is the same as the upstream remote master. Uh, and my or, or my branch here that allows players to have enough time to think while playing a shogi game is still... Uh, well, it was developed or last edited January 1st. Uh, still pending approval. I guess there's some challenge with testing it. Maybe I need to get on testing that. Anyhow, thanks for everyone for watching. It's been a while since we've done this deep kind of code dive. I guess that's the other reason I did this. Um, just to see like if this is something I should do more of, and I think the answer is, even if I do more of this, doing it on stream in this kind of presentation is just not the best way to present it, so we'll only do this if we can come up with a better way to present it in the future. But yeah, thanks for watching. Have a good night.